Howdy, I'm Rowan Westlick, an RTF student here at ACC and your host of Cinemaworks Late Night. Joining us on tonight's episode, we have John Langmore and Bud Force. They've co-produced and co-directed a documentary called Cowboys, which will be premiering October 25th at the Austin Film Festival. It's a life, it's a desire out here that not everybody has or understand or will ever understand. Cowboy to me, it just seemed like if I didn't do it anymore that, you know, something would be gone. Cowboys know what you do, it's, it's who you are, you know, it's just something in you. It's rough. Pays low, houses are rough, the hours are long, and there's isolation and it doesn't work for everybody. My husband said, I've always been a cowboy, I've never done nothing but be a cowboy. You know, the money isn't important, I'm a cowboy. And I said, okay. <laughs> There'll be younger guys that come out and make it for a little while, and then they they just can't take the isolation. And it don't take long once they get out here to know if they're going to make it or not. They've been talking about the cowboy dying for a hundred years, but that same old time spirit is still in them and it always will be. I think you have to like to suffer if you want to really be a good cowboy. And we're back. Don't run off or John and Bud will lasso you in again. Thank you, John and, thank you, John and Bud, for being here. It's, you bet. It's pleasure a pleasure to have y'all. So uh, y'all both have amazing stories. And, and John, I know that uh, you You've been a former working cowboy. You worked on these ranches, uh, these massive ranches around the U.S., like just photographing it. And, uh, and then you also wrote a book called The Open Range and uh, America's Big Outfit Cowboy, where you, you wrote and photographed these large groups of cowboys. And, then, uh, and now you're premiering the Cowboys movie and the Austin Film Festival. And, uh, and then, Bud, you're also a award-winning director and cinematographer, and you're a former rodeo cowboy. So how about we kind of start with you, John, and we'll kind of go about like where, uh, what your career was like, sure. and then, you know, how you met, but. All right. Um, well, so my, you know, my relationship with the cowboy began, I, I suppose if you take it back to its original roots, my great-grandfather was a Teddy Roosevelt Rough Rider, and he filled, and he worked all around the West, filled my dad's head with stories of cowboys. My dad cowboyed a summer, fell in love with it, but you know, pursued a professional life, and uh, he wound up becoming a photographer and did a book on the cowboy in 1975. And so he would come home from all of his trips and fill my head with these stories of these big ranches out west. And and I was at the time had started reading, you know, hearing his stories from his grandfather and then his stories on these ranches. And I was reading books by a western author, a guy named Will James, uh, okay. legendary in the cowboy world. I read all of his books as a kid, just decided you know, I just got to be a cowboy. And I was raised in Richardson, Texas, you know, about as far away from big outfits as you could get. And, uh, do you have a lot of siblings too? And I do. I had, uh, had an older brother and a younger sister, and my brother cowboyed as well. Okay. Uh, he did it, I think, three summers. And uh, so I, when I was 12 years old, told my dad, uh, you know, get me a job on one of these ranches you visited. And I remember getting the postcard in the mail. He said, I found this guy that'll hire you on. He, he told this guy I was 13, even though I was 12. He didn't think he'd hire me if I was 12. Oh, wow. So I went up there. I didn't know anything, and but still fell in love with it. And so cowboyed there that first summer. And then for the next 11 summers after that, I'd 
go out with a wagon, brand calves the first half of the summer, and then go back to that first ranch in eastern Montana for the second wow. half of every summer. And, you know, it, it was funny. When I finally quit cowboying um, was my first summer after law school, my first summer of law school, the, the summer, I worked on a ranch, went out with a wagon, branded calves the first half, and then went and worked for a law firm the second half of the summer and made as much <laughs> in my first week as a lawyer as I had the whole first half of the summer as a cowboy. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was the last summer I ever cowboyed. And so, you know, pursued a professional life until much like my dad. Um, so you're still like working as like a lawyer? Uh, yeah, I, uh, just slightly. Okay. I, I work just with, you know, I just really have one client today. Um, yeah. And then I took up photography really seriously in 2006 and, um, you know, it evolved into the project you mentioned in the book and right. ultimately, you know, partnering up with Bud on the film. All right. So then, Bud, how was your career before you met, met John and, and then what was it like meeting John? Yeah, it was a unique experience. I just moved to Austin, didn't really know too many people got an office for my production company downtown and walked up and uh, saw John Langmore, his name on the door of the office next to me. And if he wasn't there, so I went and Googled it to see who my new neighbor was. And I saw these pictures of big outfit cowboys and cowboying. And I thought, man, I can't wait to meet this guy. Like what luck. And by the way, we were at the end of a dark, dank hallway. So the odds of me getting an office right next to this guy in this one specific building at the end of this sort of depressing little catacomb <laughs> is, me. is unique. Yeah. So John's there one day and I walk in and man, I just come from this big ranch up in the panhandle and I was wearing flip flops and shorts and had long hair and this and that and the other. And I'm like, John, you know, hey, nice to meet you. I saw you shoot cowboys. I kind of shoot cowboys too and just came from this ranch. And I remember John kicked back and he was kind of like, hmm, okay. But we started talking and got to know a little bit about each other. And, uh, you know, it wasn't six months later that we decided we'd start working on the film, I'd say. Yeah. And, and I'll say, you know, to add a little flavor to that, you, you know, Bud walks in with long hair, Willie Nelson t shirt, flip flops and starts talking about the Tongue River Ranch. And I, and I was trying to, I was thinking about going to the Tongue River Ranch. I was just wrapping up the book. And I'm thinking, how does this guy know the Tongue River Ranch? I bet there's not five people in Austin that have right. ever heard of the Tongue River. And I'm trying to get on there right now. And he's my next door neighbor. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> what are the odds of this? Right. So, of course, we were destined, you know, to become friends after that. And, not necessarily destined to make a documentary film, but I guess that's the way it worked out. Right, and y'all both happen to be former cowboys. Yeah, and, right. And now you're, uh, you, you decided to shoot a documentary. Is that, y'all were both focusing on doing a documentary? Is that kind of what you wanted to do originally? Or were you thinking about doing like a, a Western or something like that? For me personally, I haven't been that interested up to this point of doing a narrative feature. Mm -hmm. Even with my production company, we shoot a lot of commercial work, but it's all based in reality. And I don't mean reality TV, but real people doing real things. Right. And so I'm uh, more nonfiction at heart, I'd say. So I'd never had any thoughts of doing like a narrative feature, quote unquote, Western. Mm -hmm. um, only, you know, a documentary styled video. And I think for both of us, we hadn't seen really any documentary on the American cowboy that was both authentic and also potentially marketable to a widespread audience. There's a couple super real docs out there about cowboys, mm -hmm. but it's more so by cowboys for cowboys, sort of like 1980s skateboard videos, but cowboy style, you right. know, just home videos of people roping steers and sort of getting into these predicaments. And right. so we had the capabilities to create something that would be a little bit more cinematic since that's what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. And we had the background to go through and create a storyline that was hyper authentic. Every movie you go, whether it's a narrative feature or a doc, you go and you watch it about the cowboy. Oftentimes, there's, there's little details that are overlooked or missed for one reason or another. And it may be the types of saddles they're riding, or it may be the nature of the work. 
the cowboy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, it can mean just your classic redneck living in the suburbs, or it can mean the big outfit cowboy that we're talking about, or a rodeo cowboy, all, all these like subcultures of it. Right, and we so y'all wanted... are like the, the sorry, y'all are like the, the cowboy experts, and, and now you're, uh, you're, you're about to embark on this big film, and since you've already been there, you know how massive these ranches are. How, how did you plan this out? Like, what, what was your plan going and filming all these? Did you think you were just gonna do it? Like, were, was your plan to do it in a year? Or like, how was it for, uh, who, who was like Yeah, that first this? timeline Bud came up with, he was like, we can do this whole thing in a year. And I hadn't, so by the way, like, you know, back to your last question, I'm a photographer that made a film. Unlike Bud, Bud's a filmmaker, right. you know, and I needed a partner with a guy like Bud. Um, you know, I had a, a long-standing relationship with the subject matter. That's what brought me into the film. You know, Bud came at it obviously with a cowboy background as well, but he came in, you know, more as a filmmaker. Uh, so, and I remember him, you know, saying, yeah, we can get this thing done in a year. And I had just finished, you know, I was, at that point, I was, <laughs> Uh, over four years into my book project, right. and I remember thinking, ha, <laughs> you know, I haven't yeah. done anything in a year. That's like if everything went like clockwork, mm -hmm. um, which of course it didn't. So it wound up, I think, from the point we started to the point that we premiere uh, this month, it'll be a couple months shy of four years. Um, so, and, and it, the, the way we started was, um, and, and I think it was a wise approach to doing a documentary film, and I'd recommend it for anyone. It wasn't like we invented it ourselves. You know, right. we borrowed a bit from a playbook, but what we decided to do was we put in a little bit of money of our own and went to a couple of ranches to make a teaser to create the concept for the film that people could look at and relate to, and Bud did an amazing job editing what we had shot on three or four ranches, I guess. Three ranches. Three ranches. And then we put that up on Facebook and I was connected to the cowboy world and kind of the Western world through my Facebook page. And someone out of the blue wrote us and said, hey, I want to help you get this film made. And you know, that's how the and funding helped, for like, it. And they helped like produce that? Yeah, that, yeah, and that was how, you know, really the funding came together for it. And, awesome. And then once, we, and that was enough for us to have start in full scale production. At that point we had enough money to shoot the whole film, not all the post-production work, but so then we just started out and, you know, I knew which ranches I wanted to go to because I had just been to all of these ranches. Right. So I went to the ones where I knew the folks the best. Right, um, and the person that helped produce this, is this, uh, are they part of like, they work at the ranches or like, are this like someone that works in the film industry? She, um, she moved to America 20 years ago, uh, a German lady, and she is very tied to the Western world, mm -hmm. a horsewoman, a, a loves the cowboy and all the, the ideas of the West and the philosophies of the West and all that that would entail. And uh, uh, so I would say from that perspective is, is where she came, right. came okay. to it from. Cool, so and then when y'all uh, started on this project, I heard it was just a crew of three people. Yes, sir. You two and one other person. Always. And then what was, uh, what was their like role in this uh, project, I guess? To do a project like this or to work on a, on a film of any sort, whether it's a short film, a commercial or whatnot, you know, it's departmentalized and you need specialists in each department, whether that's audio or lighting or filming or directing or any of that. But to operate in this type of environment, we don't, we can't bring in that many resources. Right, right. It's dangerous uh, working around livestock, especially if people haven't worked around livestock before. There's a lot of factors that go into it that offer unique challenges to this type of film. So we, the short answer would be we all had to wear a lot of hats, including a cowboy hat. They had to have some kind of <laughs> cowboy experience before just going out there with you. No, more common didn't. sense. Yeah, okay. yeah like right. um, uh, and, and I will say it's funny because, um, you know, we kept the crew small because, it, so we went to eight of these big outfits to shoot the film, uh, or sorry, 10 outfits, eight states. Um, 
So we were moving around a lot, and uh, um, you know, if you had just gone to one ranch, you could have established the relationship to bring in a bigger crew. Mm. But when you're going to ten different ranches, and we'd stay for about ten days apiece, but it wasn't like we're going to come do a film about your ranch and we're going to bring in a whole bunch of people. We were there for 10 days, we filmed 10 days, and then you know that was it for that ranch. Right. And we went there specific times a year for specific work. So we just had to keep the crew small because they, you know, the thing about cowboys is, first of all, they don't want you getting any of them hurt, which is easy right. to do when you're around livestock. You know, when they're on horses, some of them might be green broke horses. You know, there's, you know, a thousand pound cows running around everywhere. So first thing, they don't want you getting any of the crew hurt. Secondly, they don't want you interfering with their work. You know, mm -hmm. you could stand up at the wrong time and ruin a full day of work for those guys if you sent all the cows running back the direction that they just brought them from. Right. And that never happened, did it? Thank God, no, it didn't, no, it did not, by the way, but okay. it's funny because like on that first trip, and especially, you know, I knew Bud had been around some ranches, but I had never met the guy that he's worked with that he brought with us, Hank Wisrote. And we didn't really know each no, other No, we didn't know each well. other, you know, oh, wow. not really well at all. Well, it you seemed know? like it worked out pretty good. It did, but I was so anxious about getting off the ranch without a wreck, mm -hmm. you know, two guys I don't know, and especially Hank, who'd never been on a ranch at all, you know, like, oh, just please get us out of here without getting somebody hurt or right. without ruining a day's work. And, and they had like rules for you guys, kind of like, hey, look, this yeah, is the, yeah, no, these the, are your rules. And, and yes, more, yes, pretty much. And it depended on the work, you know, if the work was real serious, then they would be real serious, you know, and there'd be times they'd be a little bit looser. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, it, it, it all worked out well. Every time we drove off a ranch and nothing bad had happened, it was just like, oh, thank God, you know. <laughs> yeah. And same when I was doing the book, every time I left without having a wreck was like, oh, thank God. And you were currently working on the book as you were doing this project? So what I was doing, I thought I had finished the book at the point that we started the film, but then I, I brought my cameras with me uh, while we were shooting the film. So I, we wound up using quite a bit of the images that I shot during the making of the film wound up being in the book because he took a long time to make the book, the publisher did. So I would just, every time I got done with another shoot, I'd send him whatever I had from that. And then we used some of that still imagery in the film as well. Right. And Bud, you mentioned in, uh, this before that like 10 years ago, people trying to do a project like this would be hundreds and thousands of dollars. And y'all are doing this with a group of three people and like the equipment, the what's what has been like a change you've seen in like the technology that's allowed you to be able to make like a film like this? Well, even though we didn't use DSLR cameras as far as filming, the change happened. It, the change literally happened. I think the moment in time was with the Nikon D90. And whenever that camera came out, that was the first DSLR that shot video. Mm. And for me personally, and armies of other photographers out there that changed their whole mindset. So it was within a year after that of learning how to operate more light and fast. And then the technology since then, since 2009 or whatever, it's just been tumbling over itself as far as new capabilities. Right. You know, there's shots in this film that we literally shot with a point and shoot because that was the best camera to use at that moment in time mm -hmm. as far as quickness of speed to capture that movement, you know, whatever the scene was that we used it for. Right. But all the technological advances from smaller drones or just using drones mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the first place to these tiny cameras that we can take into spots that would have been almost impossible 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. All that technology allows for almost anybody to go out with a basic set of cameras and create something special. Because it, oftentimes it doesn't fall back on the camera itself. You know, it's more so the creative team that's using those cameras and right. what they can do with it. Yeah, you know, and so like, as a photographer, like, because um, I'm, I'm starting some photography myself, how did photography lend itself um, when you started like doing more filmmaking and all that? Or did you start out, like you started out doing photography and then you went into filmmaking? 
I only did photography. I started out as a photojournalist when I was freelancing, and then that moved into commercial work, and that niche specifically were composites. Mm -hmm. So shooting lots of photos, highlighting setups, and then combining those into digital imagery. Mm -hmm. um, that moving into video, I think compositionally, for me anyways, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but for me, I really strived to bring my photographic composition into my cinematography. Right. So whenever I'm shooting video or motion, all of my composition I set up like a photograph, it only relies on a new element of movement. So rather than thinking about a single composition whenever I set up a scene in my head, like a, you would a photograph, I'm it's thinking... Like a still image almost, but with... I'll, I start it with a still image, but I realize that image is going to move. So I try to maintain a series of still compositions in one single scene. Right. Because the scene may change as you're shooting it. So I may have you in one thirds of the film, but as you move, I may change that to where now it's suddenly full frame and you're wide angle and you're directly in the middle of the frame. Right. Seems like taking it scene by scene really helps you like get the detail of like the whole image. Because I had a friend who did photography and he he just like uh, he makes better images than me in video sometimes and it's like wow like that's pretty cool. Um, the biggest challenge with it coming as a photographer is the photograph says a thousand words and you're trying to communicate all this messaging into one frame. That's what right. photography is. You're trying to bring in all the emotion and all the aspects of that scene into one frame. And in video, you have to bring all that emotion in in a different way because you have another dimension of movement, mm -hmm. but you also have an additional dimension of multiple frames, not off of the single clip, but all of your cuts too. So it's not just filming the scene of the cowboy on the horse, it's okay, we're gonna need the close-ups of the horse's eyes, and we're gonna need to be able to read the cowboy's face for this scene, and that cowboy's wearing great spurs, so we're gonna wanna show her spurs, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So there's added stuff to think about. For sure. But the photographic composition and cinematography is the base of it all. Right, so you guys, so you're like the the filmmaker and then you're the cowboy expert. I mean, you're a cowboy expert too, but... We're both book. filmmakers on this project, filmmakers. by the way, because right. there's this whole storyline aspect sure. of it, and there's no way we could have derived this story without both of us and a number of other people trying right. to hammer this thing out. And so what would, what would y'all say would be, like, the hardest experience at this? Like, what was, was there ever a time when there was, like, a really big challenge on this... Uh, on this film project that y'all had to overcome, <clears throat> I guess. John? You know, it's funny for me coming off a photo project where it was me and a bag of cameras, you know, showing up the ranches and just having myself to account for. Probably the biggest change was working with a crew, even a small crew. Like okay. now, you know, I've got other people I've got to incorporate into the whole thing, and uh, you know, which has its own set of rewards, separate and distinct from, uh, you know, working by yourself. But um, you know, every like every step of the way was its own challenge, like getting the money to start the film. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, finding the right editor, um, you know, all of the dynamics in the editing room, me, Bud, and Lucas, our editor, uh, uh, Lucas Harder, a guy in St. Louis, you know, like three people trying to come to the same place on an overarching mm -hmm. story and the individual pieces of the story, you know, and the sequence of all of it. I mean, all of those things are, um, you know, a challenge in a way. There wasn't any... You know, there was never any point where it felt like it was all going to fall apart. You know, it felt difficult and frustrating at very various points along the way, but never any sense that, I mean, I think all of us kind of it was, all we got to do is take the next step. Mm -hmm. You know, that was always kind of my thought is, you know, if we finished up on the third ranch, I wasn't thinking about, you know, the premiere of the film. I was thinking about, 
I got to line up the fourth ranch. Right. That's all we got to do. You yeah. know, I mean, I'm just thinking about the next step One right step in front of me. And, and it is, I really think it's the only way to move through, you know, a super long term, very intensive project is to stay focused on the next step. You want to keep one eye on the distant horizon and the end game and make sure right. nothing you do, you know, that everything you're doing now is geared towards that. But For once sure. you kind of have that plotted out, you know, really your attention just needs to be on, you know, the next step that you're going to take. And it, it, it allows you to move through it because if you're thinking about something four years down the road, it can just be kind of overwhelming. Right. And uh, so, how, like, when, when you were filming at these, uh, these ranches, how was the, the, the other cowboys, how was their reaction to this? Were they excited? Were they, were they like, hey, yeah, get a shot of me on this horse real quick? Or like, what was, did you, I'm sure you have like a lot of friends already out there, but um, what was kind of like their experience in, in your opinion? Like, did they? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, those guys are, you know, they're proud of what they do and they right. know that there's a mystique associated with their lifestyle so they're you know they're open to showing it but they you need to earn their respect for sure <clears throat> like more than a lot of professions um, although I think it applies across all of them once you earn their respect then it's just smooth sailing you know then they accommodate you and um, you, you, you know they got to get their work done but you know, they're very accommodating and gracious and, and they, they want their story told if, and I think that's probably with any documentary film that, uh, you know, people want their story told if they feel you're going to tell it in an honest, authentic way. Right. And you just want to make sure that when you're explaining that to them that they feel comfortable with it. Um, you bet. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these, uh, these drone shots kind of wanted to talk about, like, you know what what drones you were using and like if there was ever a moment where you were like you saw the sunrise and you're like I gotta get that shot real quick or something like if there every, was a every lot sunrise <laughs> every sunrise <laughs> just about yeah um, but yeah what, what drones were you using um, for like because I know it's like the weather was probably crazy out there especially in the winter time like temperature like what did you have a lot of experience using drones and um, what kind of drones were you using? I started piloting drones in 2012 okay. with the first generation of DJI's Phantom line and then moved through all the way to the Phantom 4. When, like John said, we've been working on this project for four years now. So when we began, I think we were shooting on the Phantom 3. And we were using small drones, quadcopter drones, not octocoppers. A lot of these types of scenes we were shooting you know, we staged nothing. So the storm clouds roll over the horizon and the cowboys are driving the 500 head of cattle towards the storm. You've only literally have seconds to get that drone in the air and grab that shot. So what you would compromise with big setups, say a red camera on an octocopper or something, you would just lose the scenes in this type of environment. You have to move so fast. So right. we started with the DJI three and moved into the four and brought in Mavics, both Mavic one and Mavic two, all DJI. And then uh, predominantly we would use a lot of Inspire two footage with the Zen Moose X5 camera. Okay. Some of our signature drone shots that we have in the film, we would use that and we would pull out that setup whenever we would have more time to get established, you know, in the filmmaking itself and be like, okay, we know in an hour these guys are gonna be driving the cattle through this canyon. So let's get out, get staged, have everything ready to go, and then put that puppy in the air. So was there, was there like a shot ever that you really wish you would have caught that you just, you just couldn't maybe because you didn't have your camera or something like that? Was there ever like an in particular moment that maybe you could describe to us that maybe wasn't caught in the film or something? The way we handled it as far as cinematography is I was on one cam shooting 120 frames a second, slow motion. Okay. And our other camera operator was on another one shooting 24 frames a second. And we were almost mirroring everything we were shooting, give or take, you know, depending on the scene. So we had backups of every scene. So very rarely did something happen 
to where we weren't prepared for it. We right. never did not have a camera in hand. Right. As far as the drone shots, nothing sticks in my head of, oh, I wish we would have captured that and we didn't have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. We made it work because we had right. it all right there ready to go always. As yeah. soon as we hit the ground on a ranch, you know, we had our A game going and we were ready to film. That's and awesome. We would have little cameras, time lapses set up while we were filming other scenes. You know, we had it kind of covered, I'd say. Right. So if there was something, it wasn't anything super striking that I remember. But again, man, it's been four years. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't remember last yeah, year. Yeah, that's a lot to remember. So, and, and there's a lot of awesome scenes. So I'm sure you had too much almost to work with. But, um, and so whenever y'all were out on these cattle drives, did you ever have to just like set down the equipment and then help them out or something? Like, did you feel like you would, you could just get your lasso and go help them out or <laughs> what was that like? What, did they ever ask you for help for anything or? Uh, not roping, but we did a little flanking calves, uh, which is basically where you wrestle the calves on the ground as uh, after, after they rope, rope the calves. And That's you, for branding. For branding. Right, right. Help move, just piddle around, not not to any significant extent while making the film. Yeah, no, when I photographed the book, I, I took all my gear and I rode right alongside the guys the whole time. You can do that with still cameras. We never got a horseback working on the film. You know, obviously one of the three of us couldn't ride horses, but also you can't work a, you know, motion camera from the back of a horse. So we didn't really, it was, we were, on foot the whole time, basically mm. filming the whole time for all practical purposes. And then if the sun was straight overhead and they were getting to the tail end of their work, we might throw in and, you know, help a little bit like Bud was mentioning. But right. We had those side-by-side -side ATVs, you know, like Kubota type deals, usually that we could drive around and keep our gear in. So okay. we could drive kind of a Jeep type. They weren't ours, they belonged to the ranch. They would just mm -hmm. let us use them to, oh, get, okay. to get to where they were, the work was going on. For sure, yeah. Awesome. And uh, so when you were going through this project, um, did, uh, did y'all ever encounter any like, like rattlesnakes or anything or anything dangerous or did y'all have to like, you know, fight them off or anything? Like, was there anything crazy like that? <laughs> See, this is what we're dispelling with the film, you know, is this notion that like, you know, you're out there, f you know, fighting off rattlesnakes. They were and, everywhere. Uh, they just kept yeah. coming at us. Swarms of locusts. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna see something out there kind of dangerous, no, right? No, yeah, I mean, sure. There's rattlesnakes out in the open country, but um, yeah, no, I wouldn't say it was, y you know, inherent to the making of the film. More than anything, what you need to be watching out for is the livestock, mm. um, you know. Partly you don't want to get kicked by a horse, but you also don't want to, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ruin a day's work for the guys. Right. Uh, but no, oh, we saw one, oh no, that, that was after the film. We saw, did see that one bear. Um, but that, that, yeah, that was in New Mexico. That was for a, it was on one of the ranches we filmed on, but it was a later shoot after we had finished the film. It was the last film. two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. Yeah, because I remember like you guys would show some like, you had to like kill, there was a picture of a rattlesnake and like it was like, seemed like it was a common thing. There was horses that were getting bit. There's like, rattlesnakes all over the West and in that type of environment. And yeah, yeah. There, there was a, a horse out there that had been bit. Uh, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm kidding, I'm <laughs> Bit by a rattlesnake. Um, and so we did see that horse, you know, right. the whole ramifications of what that looks like, you know, yeah. on livestock, but we never found that specific snake. Yeah, yeah no, sure. I mean, rattlesnakes, you know, they, they let you know they're there. They're actually, you know, of all the snakes to encounter, they're probably the least worrisome. Okay. Well, as a filmmaker, you know, I always want to do like, you know, I, I, I love cowboys and I, I actually grew up wanting to be a cowboy. Um, and so whenever I make a Western, uh, I might have to call y'all up because y'all are the experts. Um, but uh, you know how did, to reach us. Do y'all feel like after this film you're gonna get hit up by some Hollywood production teams and they're gonna be like, hey, can you help us? I want to make sure this guy looks right. You know, he's got the right cowboy hat. Because you know, I was uh, talking to y'all and he said, cowboy hat and the spurs, the boots, the right saddle. Like, you know, what what makes a cowboy in your opinion? Like, I guess y'all both have like experience, but for you, John, we could start with you. What, what do you feel like makes a cowboy? 
Yeah, boy, I'm tempted to, to well, it's, it's in the trailer, so there's a great line by an old timer uh, in the film that says, you know, if you want to really be a good cowboy, you got to like to suffer. I think there's a lot of truth to that. But, you know, I really think there's a few things that are like distill the essence of what draws people to cowboying. One for sure is a love of horses. You know, you spend mm -hmm. more time with your horse than you do with your family. Um, you yeah. know, they'll be out riding 12 to 14 hours a day. Uh, love of wide open spaces, you know, kind of like truly that sort of not being fenced in sense that, you know, everything in front of you is big and wide open. And, you know, even if you cross a fence or two, it's still you're out in the, you know, the big open country. And then I think, you know, it's a, it's a, a camaraderie among like-minded um, largely men, but not exclusively men, um, that, that keeps, you, you know, that is really sort of like in my mind is the essence of what being a cowboy really is. Right. Well, I didn't even know that, you know, this still like existed. You know, I, I grew up watching Westerns and my favorites were like Tombstone and Magnificent Seven. And Those are great ones. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and one of the, the movies that I feel like most accurately described like the life of cowboy was the John Wayne movie called Cowboys, where he like helped these youngsters kind of like, you know, um, uh, kind of experience what it's like to take these cattle and across country and all the dangers that involve and bandits, you know. Uh, and so, like, it's, it's just pretty neat that we get to see that in your film and, and there's still like, Cowboys taking cattle across country, um, and so what do you feel like has? Do you feel like it's still um, the same? Because I remember uh, you mentioned that from the 1970s till today, like there there might be like some differences. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, you know, the biggest difference is is really the fact that they use a lot of um, trucks and trailers now. Mm. And so, you, you know, it used to be in the old days, you would, old days, you know, in the 70s, <laughs> 80s, and I would say it probably started happening maybe in the mid, late 80s, they started using trucks and trailers. Before that, you know, if you needed to get to the far side of the ranch to start your day's work, you rode to the far side of the ranch. You know, you didn't load your horses in a trailer and drive to the far side of the ranch and, you know, go back in the evening and get the trailers. But the biggest implication of that to me is so, they used to take out branding wagons um, and, you know, the whole crew, 14 cowboys would travel the whole, make a circuit around the whole ranch, you know, generally over the course of six weeks and they'd brand all the calves around the whole ranch. You'd go set up camp here for five days, brand all the calves around there, move camp. And it was a chuck wagon and a bed wagon and you slept in canvas teepees. And there's still some of that going on and it's in the film. But now, and the, the reason you did that was you couldn't, it was too far to ride. You have to brand early in the day before mm -hmm. everything gets hot. It was too far to ride, to ride across the far side of the ranch, gather all the cows, you know, brand all the calves. You'd be too late in the day, so you just camp there, and then you just, you know, ride a mile to where you're going to start gathering. Now they load them in trailers and haul out there, so it's kind of killed the wagon, which... Mm. To me is, you know, heartbreaking because that was always my favorite part of cowboying. You know, you're out there living in a tent for six weeks and you all kind of come together and everybody gets to rope every day and it was just a, such a great deal. It's really right. sad to see the wagon die. There's a handful of them left, but nothing like the old days. Right. But do you, um, do they still have like cooks that use wagons and bring them out or no because the wagon's dead they don't you, you know and, and again some ranches there are a few ranches that pull out wagons what I'll say now is most of them will pull out for like a week mm. and whereas it used to be you always did the circuit around the whole ranch and it took you six maybe eight weeks to do that now they'll pull out to one spot really for the sake of maintaining tradition mm. a few of them you know, Arizona. stay out no that's true yeah no Arizona still keeps their wagons out, you know, for months at a time. That's, in northern Nevada, there's a couple places that still pull out wagons, you know, that are, they'll stay out for six weeks. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty much over. It's a, my dad, when he photographed his book, I called him from the airport when I was coming back from my first ranch, and I said, 
sounds like the wagons are dead, you know, because mm. I didn't know I'd been out of it for about 30 years. And he's like, damn, when I did my book, every ranch I went to pulled a wagon. Right. Wow. And so I guess that's probably the biggest change that you notice. But the culture and the people are same. the same. Guys are the same kind of guys. The women are the same type of women. The work's the same, you know, other than this trailer and out. It's, and I think that's, you know, a point that Bud and I made in the film and felt very strongly about is that, you know, as opposed to this is a vanishing breed, a dying breed, they're alive and well. It's not oh, a yeah. growing industry, you know, because right. no one's putting together big ranches anymore. But, you know, the ones that are out there get sold all intact, you know, um, and they keep running a crew of cowboys, generally speaking. So there's not, they aren't on their deathbed at all. Right. And you Thank think God. that this film will kind of like inspire people to, because I don't know, kind of when I was watching, I was like, that'd be kind of fun. I want to go out there and see what it's like to be on the ranch. Get it. Yeah. Do you think like, well, what kind of impact do you think it has on like the, uh, the cowboy, like the cowboys in this community and then people like outside the community watching this film? Well, as far as people outside watching this film, I can probably sum it up with one story. A kid wrote in, 18 or 19 years old, was living out in Wisconsin, had, was sounding kind of like you, you know, oh, I'd like to go do that. He was pretty serious about it already to some extent. He just wasn't doing it yet. Right. And he saw that, that trailer and he wrote in a message and you know, said, wow, that's, I think that's really inspired me. I'm going to go do it. I'm looking at ranches out in Montana calling folks. Oh, yeah. And about six months later, he wrote in and he said, hey, I got this job and I'm working on this outfit with the crew and he's sleeping in the bunkhouse and he's doing it and these pictures are coming in and, you know, he's, he's cowboy, you know, right. and, and he's horseback with the crew and he's learning how to do it. So I, th I think, um, at least for that guy and, and hopefully, you know, others, once they see the full film, it'll inspire some folks on some level to go and, and want to be a cowboy. I know that whenever I watch it, I think, ah, oh, man, I'm tired of clients and filmmaking. I'll just go out there, you know, but it's got its pros and cons. Sometimes yeah. it's nice to go film cowboys for a week and then come back to your house, you know, in the hills west of Austin. Right. <laughs> and, and I'll say, you know, cowboying is an easy profession to enter. You know, if you get about $2,000 worth of gear, you need a saddle, a rope, spurs, shaps, a hat. That's about it in a bedroll. They'll hire you on. You know, you can show up and say, I got my gear, I don't know much, but I'm willing to work. They'll All you train got, you and everything. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it will be hard on you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, to like, but, but the, if you're willing to give it a go, you know, anybody can go give it a shot. It's, it's a very unique profession in that regard. Right. Teach you a lot of life skills on how to survive, probably. And yeah, know, yeah, yeah, how to get yelled at a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take yeah. it with a grin. They love to yell at each okay. other. It's pretty funny. So after, after making the film, did y'all get to show it to the people out in the community? Did you have a big screening or anything? Or I know that some of them will be coming to the... Uh, the Austin Film Festival to watch it in the Paramount, but did y'all get to, were they excited to see the finished product or? I think everybody's pretty excited. That was part of the making of, you know, process of it all. And we've shown it to individual cowboys. And I think the closest we've come to a screening was on Tongue River that we were talking about a little while ago. And I showed it to the crew of cowboys there. And that was the first time seeing kind of everyone together and their reaction of, of what it was and you know from what we can tell so far the cowboys are hopefully going to like it and that's of paramount importance to us for sure if the cowboys in the bunkhouse can't put it on tv and watch it and want to watch it and appreciate it for what it is then nothing else matters it doesn't really matter if the general public likes it at that point because it's not what it's supposed to be, which mm -hmm. is full authenticity of this culture, just like you would show authenticity of any culture. So if you're filming a documentary about people, you want to make sure that they will like it first. That's because they're the ones you're filming it about. Is that what you're kind of saying? Or? Well, I don't even know if I would necessarily say like it, I suppose, but um, respect it. Right. You know. Sure. You, you want them to feel that, because you're telling someone else's story. Right. 
And so, you, you know, you want them to feel that you've told their story honestly and respectfully and, you know, authentically. And that's, you know, and, and I mean, I consider the, the cowboy world my own personal world, you know, so it has this added level of importance to me that, you know, this story of these people that I've lived with and worked with and know so well that, you know, they look at it and say, yeah, no, that's, that you told it the way it's supposed to be told. Yeah, or, for sure. Um, yeah. So, I guess the end goal was to always show it at the Awesome Film Festival, right? Or was it, what, what was your goal to end this, uh, with this project? Where did you, where did you want to have it shown? Well, one thing I should mention, back to this, by the way, we're going to have two screenings, one in Amarillo uh, around, a, there's a working ranch rodeo association, so we're going to screen it there when they have their finals. And so that's going to be all working cowboys. You know, it'll be okay. 2,000 working cowboys. And then we do another one up in Elko, Nevada for a different group of cowboys in February. So, like, we have big screenings of the film for the cowboy world, you know, where we're just like we're going to get the direct feedback at the moment, which is going to be very rewarding. And, yeah, listen, y y you know, I, I am so happy to be premiering it in our hometown at the Austin Film Festival, which I've been involved with forever. I've gone to it for years. I think it's one of the greatest film festivals, definitely with respect to storytelling. And, you know, doing it in our hometown among our own group of friends, and especially at the Paramount. The capital of Texas. Yeah, no, it now, just it couldn't just, be any better. I mean, I, I could, personally, I could not be happier. Right. So, um, any uh, any advice you would have for RTF students or people trying to get into the business? I know your son; he's trying to get into it. And what would you what would you share with them to uh, give them courage or inspiration as they go out and try to be making documentaries or or big films, feature films? I know for me, I would tell film students to get started and do it. I think yeah. a lot of people I talk to. It's always, oh, I would love to do this, but. There's always a but. I don't have the best cameras. I don't have this. I don't have a writer. I don't have this. You just have to do it and keep moving forward, as is anything in life, I suppose. But if you have a phone with a camera, you can get started on the creative process. But I would say to get the ball rolling, once you get out of the driveway, everything's easy. The hardest part's just getting out of the driveway. For sure. The other aspect of it, I think, is especially in long-term projects like this, like a feature film where you're gonna be working on it for years, you have to have a heart-to-heart -heart with yourself before you get started in pre-pro and make sure that this is something you can maintain passion for. Right. You were talking about the challenges earlier. What did we face? And my biggest challenge throughout was the psychological challenge and the persistence of it you can't quit. You have to keep going. You have to keep going. And because it is a long-term project, things won't always go your way. You're going to run into challenges just like anything. So you have to keep going. But as far as filmmaking, it's not in regard to cinematography or anything like that. That'll come if you're passionate about it. You'll learn it. You'll study it on your own. But no, it's getting started and then it's continuing to walk through it until you finish it. For sure. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I you know, couldn't agree more with uh, just get started, you know, and then do it one step at a time. Don't, you know, think about the fact you're going to be working on it four years, try and stay focused on the next step. But, but in addition to that, I would add that, you know, I think what you need to feel passion, which is, you know, in large respect what Bo was saying, a documentary film, and I say the same for documentary photo projects, if you're going to invest that much time documenting something, make sure it's something that you have some inner feeling for, you know, some passion for, you know, the subject matter of the project itself. It makes it more enjoyable, and I for sure think it makes for a better end product, you know, if, if you really feel passion, as opposed to, wouldn't that be clever 
to go make a film about something, but I really don't care about the subject at all, you know, but boy, it seems very clever and I bet it'll, you know, make it through the gatekeepers at the film festivals. I, I wouldn't, you know, I would never advise that. I would say go find something you're passionate about and all the rest will take care of itself. Getting into the film festivals and having it be successful and well-reviewed and all that should sort itself out. Gotcha. Yeah, the process is everything in filmmaking. The end result is almost irrelevant until you get there because it will just be whatever it is, you know. It's, it's the process of it and having the passion for it to get you through to the end. If you're not doing it for the project itself and your passion is not built into the project and it's focused on something else like ego or is Hollywood going to see this or anything else, I think that sinks a lot of ships. Mm. You have to be focused on the purity of the process, I think. For sure. Well, thank you, John, and thank Absolutely. you, for, thank you for, having for coming us. on the show. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all at the uh, awesome film festival. Yeah. Um, so Cowboys will be premiering at the uh, Paramount Theater. And uh, remember, all ACC faculty and staff and students get $25 off the Austin Film Festival Lone Star Badge by using the promo code ACCLS25. So get your tickets now before it's too late. Hope to see you there.